I'd say Radio Land. What is it? <laughs> but anyway, on live stream. There we go. Let's stand as we sing, Somebody Loves Me. And the world is the preacher. <laughs> I've been wondering that all day. But he's he's traveling, and uh, he and Faye's going to stay with his brother and keep their kids while they're doing some stuff. And y'all be in prayer for him. I guess you wonder how I got this up here. Let me go ahead and explain it to you. At Tommy and Anna's wedding, we were sitting at the reception dinner across from the preacher. And it's loud in there. And the preacher said something to me. He said, on Wednesday night. Well, I thought he said, would I come up and pray on Wednesday night? And I said, yeah, I'd be glad to. Well, Ann told me later that the preacher said, night such this night. So here I am. I thought to myself, if he had enough faith in me to ask me, I ought to take the time to say a few words about the Lord. So that's what we'll do tonight. Anyhow, we want to have our prayer concerns. I don't know many. I haven't had any new ones uh, except for one. I want to remember Karen Allman. I haven't heard anything since Sunday out of, about her. And continue to remember for Harold's dad, which Harold said he's doing real good. But they mentioned tonight, someone mentioned that Don Luther had had a heart attack. 
and a stroke. Okay, let's remember him in prayer. Do we have any other prayer concerns? Yes, let's remember this prayer concern. I'm going to ask my brother Mike if he would come up and pray for us. Let's pray. Your kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we had to come out to your house tonight hear your word and the fellowship together. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings you've given us this week. And we pray that you'll be with each and every prayer request that's just been mentioned. We pray that you'll continue to heal and comfort as only you can. Be with Ronnie as he speaks tonight. Help us to leave here. And dear Lord, thank you. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you for all you do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A subject that we all are familiar with. Let me turn this thing on. Okay, now I'm, I can be heard. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is about the love of Christ. There's nothing short when you go to talking about that. I want to start using, or I'll be using mainly, one verse of Scripture. And that'll be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, you can take that and you can study on that for hours at a time because I'm telling you, I've been doing it. And every time you read it, there's something more in it. But the greatest thing that any one of us that's a Christian, if there's one that's not been saved, he don't know what we're talking about. But as a Christian, there's nothing greater than the love of Christ. I'm going to be talking tonight, and what I do or what I read will be out of the King James Version. And uh, the theme of what I'm doing tonight is the love of God. And uh, before I start in, I want to go through this verse and, and go through it real good, but I'm going to read something to you. It's a... Uh, a great preacher is telling about two other great preachers. Now, what I'm going to read to you is from W.A. Criswell. He's a very, very, he was a very, very good, well-known speaker. But he used this text, and I'm going to read to you the text. And he's talking about two great evangelists, Harry Morehouse, which is not as well-known. He's an English evangelist and D.L. Moody and where they met in life and what happened in, in the meeting or, or how they were blessed how they blessed each other but in reading <coughs> wait a minute I wanted to tell you a little something about the two It says, D.L. Moody, a well-known evangelist, and Henry Morehouse, 
is a great but not as well known. Henry Morehouse lived from 1840 to 1880. Only lived 40 years. D.L. Moody lived from 1837 to 1899, 62 year old. So we're going to be talking about preachers in the 1800s. But this is W.A. W. Criswell's account of an incident that happened. And I'll read you a little bit of the real thing. This is the way he told it. But it says, in reading of the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody, I came across an incident that he described that was astonishing to me. The American evangelist was in Birmingham, England, holding a revival meeting, one that the Lord signally blessed. After it was over, a young man came up to him and bid him goodbye and said, Mr. Moody, I am coming to America someday, and when I do, I will preach for you. Well, Moody was kind and taken aback by the boldness of the young fellow, but being a gracious gentleman, he said, well, when you come, we shall welcome you. He said about six months later, Mr. Moody in Chicago received a letter from the young man, and he was in New York. The boy's name, he called him a boy here, but it says the boy's name was Harry Morehouse. And the lad, the young fella, wrote to Mr. Moody saying, I am in New York City. I will be in Chicago this coming Wednesday night, and I will preach for you. Now, you have been, now, now if you have been a pastor, you would know the frustration of that. So he went... So he went to some of his deacons and said, Brethren, I have to be gone. I have an engagement, and I don't know what to think, so I'm going to tell you I have a young man coming, and he wants to speak, so I'm going to let you have the service and let the young man introduce him and then be prepared to continue the service and say the concluding remarks as needed. So Moody went on his way. The young fella came. He was introduced. He preached on John 3.16. And the Spirit of God was in the service as the young man spoke about the love of Christ. And according to the habit of Moody, after the service was done, all who were interested were invited to stay. Nobody left. The young fella gave the invitation as he had seen Moody do. And there were ten people saved that Wednesday night. Well, the deacons came up to him and said, Would it be possible for you to preach tomorrow night? And the young man replied, I'm in the city with nothing else to do. I shall be delighted. So a bigger crowd come Thursday night. <coughs> and when the young man well, the young fella extended the invitation. There were 20 people saved. Preaching on the same text as he did the night before, John 3, 16, and the love of Christ. The deacon said to him, could you stay tomorrow night and preach for us? The young fella replied, I'm in the city with nothing else to do. I shall be happy. So Friday night they had the service. The crowd was larger, and when he extended the appeal, there were 30 people saved, preaching on the same text, the love of Christ Jesus. Saturday, Mr. Moody came back from his assignment, and his wife said to him, she said, Dear, there is a great revival in our church. And Moody replied, Why? I made no preparations for a revival. His wife said, it is something God is doing. Well, Mr. Moody said, well, who's leading it? I invited no one to come and lead a revival. And his wife, his wife replied, it's that young man from Birmingham, England. Wednesday, there were 10 people saved. Thursday, there was 20 saved. Friday, there was 30 saved. And the deacons have asked him to preach again tonight, Saturday night. Moody said, why? We never have services on Saturday night. 
But the people asked, and he's preaching tonight. Then she added, and dear, I hope you are converted. It was that last remark that got him. While Moody thought, I've been preaching 20 years, and she says to me, I hope you're converted. Moody said in this autobiography, he says, I went to church that night. I sat on the front row with critical eye and critical spirit. And the young fellow stood up there. And as he had the three nights before, he took the same text, John 3.16, and spoke about the love of Christ. And Moody said, my heart was strangely moved. And I understood what my wife meant. After the service, there were more than a dozen saved that night. He asked the young man to preach for the next day, which was Sunday. And the young fellow replied, I'm in the city with nothing else to do. I shall be happy to preach. So he stood up on Sunday morning, took the same text, and preached from John 3.16 for the love of God for a lost world. And Moody says that for six weeks, every night, for six weeks, that the young man stood there in the pulpit and preached from John 3.16. Then Moody says, it turned my life. For heretofore, I had been preaching, he said, on the Mount Sinai side of Calvary, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. But after that conversion, I began to preach on the Mount Zion side of Calvary. God's love for us, God's mercy, God's grace extended to us. I'm going to read one more verse of Scripture before we go back to uh, John 3.16. But it's Titus 2.11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. John 3.16. What a sermon. What a message. What a revival. Have a revival solely on John 3.16 every night. You can't tell about the love of God too much. It don't get old. It's always new. It's always fresh. Bear with me just a minute. I've got so much scribble I can't even find it. I want to take John 3.16 now and I want to go through it closely. It don't sound like, to, to, a, to say it, it don't sound like a lot. I learned that verse, I guess I was eight or nine, Miss Poe's class or Miss McIntyre's class, I'm not sure which one both of them taught us Bible verses that's the only thing I ever knew about the Bible was what I learned in the first and second grade and Lord I just I'm, I'm so thankful for those teachers and and doing that spending that time with us for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God, for God, God, our creator, the creator of this world, the creator of everything, our Lord, our Father in heaven. It says, our Father. For God so loved. What does the word so loved mean? What does that mean to you? What does so loved make on it? Add to it. It means it was such a precious thing to him. It wasn't just like he wanted to do it. He desired to do that for us. He so loved you and I. What it, when it talks about the world, what is it talking about? 
they're talking about the trees and the animals and, and the grass. No, he's talking about the people in this world. He's not talking just about the ones here in Troy. He's not talking about just the whites and the blacks and the Indians, the Japanese, the Chinese. He's talking about everyone. God so loved the world. That's every person. That he gave his only begotten son. He, God himself, begotten son, his son, of him, of him, his own. He loved this world. He loved the people in this world so much that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever... Now, that's a little bit of a strange word, isn't it? Whosoever. Man, what a big word. Did you know that when he inspired that word to be wrote, what that word included? Every human being on this earth. He didn't exclude any. Now, we exclude, we exclude by not accepting him. And the only way anybody can be excluded is they don't accept it. Whosoever. That is all. That means everyone has that opportunity. That whosoever believeth. Now here's another word. Believeth. You know you think about believeth and truth. Uh, you believe with somebody when they well, I, they swear to it. Oh, I swear it's true. Or I promise that's true. That's not the kind of belief that this is. This is a heartfelt, one-on-one -on -one relationship between Ronnie Lucas and the Lord Jesus Christ. Between each one of you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know... We can put on a front. We can put on a show to each other. And I may fool Jim. I may fool him on some things. But on this one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no fooling. It's heartfelt. It's genuine. It's true. It's intimate. Intimate between you and God. No one else. It's such an important thing. That word believeth is so important. So important. That whosoever believeth in who? In him. Who is him? His only begotten son. Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. God's only son. If we don't believe in him, I don't care what anybody else tells you. I don't care what any other person says, these preachers on TV or whatever they might think. If it's not based on the blood of Christ and that personal relationship, they have nothing. We're not reading out of a book. We're reading out of the book. And that's God's word. John 3.16 was not given by some man or this was given by God. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him, in him, Jesus Christ, shall. Now, shall, shall was always... Sort of a small word, wasn't it? Not, not a very big word. I mean, that's a simple word like I learned when I was growing up. You shall not do that. And I knew what that meant. It's a very important word. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall or should not perish. Should not or shall not. What does that mean? Be, you be granted. Should not. Will not. Can't. And what does the word perish mean? Does that mean, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to me? Does it mean die? Cease to be no more? Shall not, should not perish. What words? If we can't read John 3.16 and be comforted, as Christians, I don't know what else we could read. Shall not perish, but have, but have. Not going to take it away, but we're going to be given something. We're going to be given something, but have. He is giving us something in this. But have everlasting. What does everlasting mean? That means at least for the next two weeks, don't it? I mean, the grandkids has got ball games, and that's everlasting, I think, for the next two weeks. Everlasting is something you and I don't, can't comprehend. We can't comprehend it. It's always, always, forever, not to cease, never ceasing. Forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting what? What we have now in a different, a better way. Eternal life. Everlasting life. Life, that means no death. Not talking about the natural death, but we will live on. You know, if the Lord don't come back first, we're going to die. We're going to go two ways as Christians. We're either going to die and go on, or Jesus is going to come first, we're going to go with him. But it's an everlasting life. What a precious, precious message that he could preach on John 3, 16. I'm going to read you one more text. And like I said, that was W.A. Criswell's takeoff. You know, when everybody tells a fishing story... It gets bigger and bigger. But it says, Henry Morehouse was born in 1840 in Manchester, England. For the first 20 years of his life, he was constantly in trouble and in prison more than once. But at the age of 21, in the engine room of a warehouse, a young Christian pointed him to Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says the biographer tells that the outcome Henry Morehouse saw, he believed, he rejoiced, he confessed and was ready from that hour to bear witness for Christ. Before long, he was preaching the gospel on the street corners, and in the packed halls. He is best remembered as the man moved, the man who moved, the man who moved millions. D.L. Moody was known for moving millions of people towards Jesus Christ. And it said, this is the man that moved D.L. Moody. In life of D.L. Moody by his son, a whole chapter 
It says, in the life of D.L. Moody, by his son, a whole chapter is devoted to the influence of Henry Morehouse. Morehouse taught Moody to draw his sword of, of the spirit full length and to fling the scabbard away in the end of the battle with a naked blade. What in the world? Now, I'm going to ask Kevin, what is a scabbard? Because I know he knows. Well, don't feel bad. I didn't know neither. I had to look it up. But his, his, his sword case or his gun, or gun case, whatever, that's what you keep it in until you pull it out to use it. But he told him, he said, don't keep it in there so long. Pull it on out and have it ready to use. That's what he was telling him. Henry had become a preacher with the Plymouth Brethren and had learned the importance of expository preaching. When Moody visited England in 1867, he was told of the preaching of a zealous young brethren evangelist named Henry Harry Morehouse. By this time, Morehouse had established the reputation of being one of the leading evangelists in England. Initially, Moody had not, had not, was not very impressed with young Morehouse. To Moody, Morehouse appeared to be so young and frail. Moody, however, did invite Morehouse to visit him in Chicago, not expecting him to come. That's a little bit different than what Criswell said a while ago. He was invited. He didn't invite himself. Moody's wife, Emma, upon hearing Morehouse, told her husband, I like Morehouse's preaching very, very much. He's a very different from you. He backs up everything he says with the Bible. Now, I guess that probably hurt a little bit, but you know that's true. We have too much preaching and not enough of the Bible. Everything's told, more things are told than the Bible is read. On one occasion, young Morehouse challenged Moody, you are sailing on the wrong tack. If you will change your course and learn to preach God's word instead of your own, he will make you a great preacher. When Morehouse first arrived in Chicago, Moody unexpectedly called out of town and asked Morehouse to preach for him at Farewell Hall. Morehouse preached nightly for one solid week on the love of God using the text, John 3.16. Now, again, that's a little bit different, the time frame. But still, when you get down to it, it all means the same thing. Henry Morehouse died on December 28, 1880, at the age of 40. Among his dying words were these, if it were the Lord's will to raise me up again, I should like to preach more on the text, God so loved the world. You know, we can't, sometimes we see somebody and we say, well, what are we going to tell them? We're going to talk to somebody about Jesus. What are we going to tell them? You know, we don't have to tell them anything. All we've got to do is open the scriptures, so many scriptures, scripture verses and just read them God's word we don't have to tell them anything God's word sitting here looking at us waiting for us to tell it the problem is getting ourselves ready to do it that's my problem I, I, I don't, I'm not talking for everybody that's my problem somebody asked me by what authority did I come tonight to speak I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I come on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I can tell you. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm going to read a couple of more verses of Scripture and then that pertain to this, and then we'll be dismissed. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Master... Which is the greatest commandment of the, in the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. 
And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. And Jesus answered them, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second commandment, and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. And a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. And I have loved you, that ye also love one another. This by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love to one another. And one more, and I read it a while ago, but I, I didn't read it in the context complete. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. At least, least I didn't let you out too off early. I remember the preacher had one night, but I guess I can think well, he was a little bit sick. But uh, I hope, hope that you can take something home. You got God's word. You can take something home and you can study about it. But we don't have an excuse as a Christian. I've got neighbors. I've got family that I haven't sat down and asked them if they know the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, I'm not going to have to worry about the great white throne judgment because I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to be no fun event at the judgment seat of Christ because I'm going to have to answer as a Christian for the opportunities that God placed before me and I didn't take advantage of them. And you know, that's something we all need to think about. God so loved the world. That means every soul that we come in contact with, every person. No matter how dirty they are. No matter how backward they are. No matter how bigoty they are. God loves them. And God expects Ronnie Lucas to stop. And put out his hand. And say, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Let us be dismissed. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the blessing you bestowed upon us. Lord, I thank you so much for that Thursday night. When I was 19 years old. That I came down the altar in this old church. And asked you to be my savior. To forgive me of my sins. God, I failed you so many times. And I've come short so many times in opportunities that you give me. But you still have kept me in your hand. You've got me in the center of your hand. You're not going to let me go. God, I just pray that you strengthen me. Help me to be more obedient about doing your will. Telling others about what you've done for me. God, I just pray that you'll help me to walk and be a better example in front of the ones that see me. That they might see a little glimpse of Jesus in my life. I just pray that you be with all the ones that were mentioned. Go with us. Keep us safe. In Jesus' holy and precious name we beg it. Amen. You're dismissed.